course, I, I started my research career with uh, Professor Heller, actually, and I learned to do my first physiological studies with Dr. Heller in Sheffield, um, ooh, now almost 20 years ago. Um, and it's always inevitably talking about cardiovascular disease in the heart or hyperglycemia in the heart. Um, I'm going to apologize up front that there'll be a little bit of um, common slides, but there are things that um, we, we naturally would overlap when, we, when the two topics are so, so similar. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Um, and I guess I'd start off by, um, by maybe repeating the fact that, you know, let's start with type 1 diabetes for the first, because that's where I do most of my work. And we know that in people with type 1 diabetes, compared to age match controls, there's a 10 to 15 year difference in life expectancy. And the vast majority of that difference in life expectancy comes from cardiovascular disease. Uh, and similarly, uh, we know that that risk is higher, the higher the HbA1c. So if you've got a HbA1c of over 9%, that risk is 3.65. If it's over 10%, that risk is 8.5 times higher. But the important point I want to raise here is that even in people with a inverted commas target HbA1c, 6.9%, if you look um, here, you can see there's a 2.36 times higher uh, death from any cause, a 2.92 higher death from cardiovascular disease. And so there's a thinking there that in people who are, you know, even with normal control, that glucose variability, that intermittent hypoglycemia that everyone has, is that contributing to their cardiovascular risk? The most emotive topic around, uh, around cardiac rhythms and death is, of course, dead in bed syndrome. And Professor Heller um, has just kind of talked about that in a, in a lot of detail uh, prior. I do want to raise a point, though. So the JDRF, which is a fantastic job of raising money and awareness to help treatments that stop hyperglycemia, they do quote in their online advertisement that one in 20 young people, one in 20 people like Piper will die from blood sugar. And that's not one in 20 people with diabetes type one. Uh, just to make a comment, that is the under, people under 40, if they're dying, then, then hyperglycemia naturally is a higher risk factor. Once you cross 40, then it's cardiovascular disease. Simon has shown this um, slide before, just showing the kind of a, a real example, tragically, that was captured on CGM, showing how prolonged and very deep low glucose, particularly in the context of a lot of insulin on board and in the context of recent exercise. And these factors have to come together in a way to, to get those tragic episodes of, of hypoglycemia. But I don't want to uh, show you this data as well from the Swedish registry. So the Sweden has a fantastic registry of all the people with type 1 diabetes, and they've got here 18,000 people with the detailed data set. And what I want to point out is that in these people, if you look at the blue line, the blue line is the uh, cardiac mortality for or the you know, non-fatal cardiac disease and cardiovascular mortality for people on pumps. And the red line is those with type 1 diabetes on MDI. And I want to point out the fact that, you know, the average age of these people was about 43, 44 years. They had controlled lipids, controlled blood pressure. In a sense, their risks for dying, they're, apart from the type 1 diabetes, they were very similar to someone like me. And they're in the mid to late 40s. And if you look at this, if you have type 1 diabetes and you're not on a pump, your risk of dying is more than 6 or 7% which is about four times higher than my risk of dying in the next 10 years. And if you're on a pump, you can half that. And they looked at all the other factors. They looked at duration of diabetes, blood pressure, lipids. And the only thing they can come up with was the people on pumps had a much lower rate of hypoglycemia than the people not on pumps. Um, and so there was a thought there that even the minor hypoglycemia, maybe the severe hypoglycemia having is contributing to this cardiovascular protection seen with insulin pumps there. And you can see that uh, when you look at people with more than three severe hypoglycemic effects during follow-up, there was a difference there uh, in terms of their um, mortality. Now, of course, there's lots of confounding factors in here. People with lots of severe hypoglycemia, are they more compliant with their therapy? How are they uh, adjusting things? But it's again, it's this kind of uh, circumstantial evidence linking hypoglycemia with cardiovascular disease. And then, of course, most of the interest in this field suddenly was it was exacerbated by the ACCORD study, where again, I think Simon showed uh, data suggesting that in the intensive, in both the intensive and the control arm, people with severe hypoglycemia had a higher risk of mortality. The same was seen in the advanced study, but the interesting analysis here was that it wasn't the hypoglycemia event that was leading to the mortality. Their mortality was happening up to um, a year or longer after the hypoglycemic event. A slide that I always like to show when we're talking about cardiovascular mortality and type, uh, and, uh, type 2 diabetes is this one, which is that although the intensive arm was linked with higher mortality, the people who achieved target HbA1c 
in the intensive arm had the lowest mortality. It was only those who were running high. And so by definition, they've got a high HbA1c and hypoglycemia. So they're having more variability. But those are the people who, were, who had the highest mortality there. So if we think about the mechanisms, again, I think Simon covered a lot of this in, in his talk. Um, it might be that you have an underlying substrate. So you've got someone with diabetes who might have microvascular heart disease. You may have a high risk of heart failure. If they've got type 2 diabetes, they've got metabolic syndrome, they've got a high risk of hypertension, a high risk of LV hypertrophy. Um, they may have had previous cardiac disease. They may have autonomic neuropathy. Or in all of those circumstances, during acute hypoglycemia, you get reduced cardiovascular reserve. You may get QT prolongation. Um, during hyperglycemia, you've got a high level of insulin, which again, uh, uh, reduces potassium, prolongs QT. You have reduced extracellular glucose, increased uh, beta adrenergic stimulation. And it's this combination of factors where you've got QT prolongation, high adrenaline, low potassium, high insulin on a, on a substrate that's not normal. That's when you run into to problems. And again, I think one of the most elegant studies in this field showing the incremental effect of duration of hypoglycemia on the on the QT and on the cardiac repolarization it was very elegantly shown by Elaine uh, from Simon's group a while ago. So I, I won't dwell on this one because Simon's explained it far better than, than I could. But again, Peter Novodolsky from Simon's group also showed that there's a difference in when the hypoglycemia happens. Uh, and so if you look at the, the data here, you can see that during the night, the nadir is lower at 2.66 versus 3.0. And, and of course, there are, there are fewer events, but they are longer uh, during the night. Uh, and that might, you know, the duration of episodes, there are 60 minutes during the night, 44 minutes during the day. And that, I think the duration of time at hyperglycemia may have a, a stake in, in what happens with hyperglycemia. Oops. And then as you can see there, uh, particularly with the nighttime, uh, daytime events in, in blue, you can see there's a much greater risk of atrial ectopics, but it's the bradycardias at night, a significant difference that again, they might be uh, causing more problems in, in people. Now, just before I joined Simon in about 2001, um, there's a, a series of studies done in, in his team, really looking at the impact of hyperglycemia on the heart. Uh, and if you look here, um, what you can find is on the left here, you can see as hyperglycemia occurs, you can see the potassium levels uh, drop lower. And in this, in one study, the potassium levels were uh, allowed to drop. And in the other studies, actually, they were clamped up to try and prevent the drop in potassium. So potassium was infused as well. And if you look on the right hand side there, what you can see is all, um, when you clamp the potassium at the same level and prevent it from dropping, you can see that there is a, a reduced impact of the uh, QT prolongation from hypoglycemia. And if you give people beta blockers there, and I should have labeled this slide a little bit better, but if you give them beta blockers here, you can see you can prevent, uh, sorry, if you give them beta blockers in the bottom ground, you can see that the QT prolongation from hypoglycemia is prevented, even though there's a strong adrenaline response. Um, so beta blockers there, although typically people are worried about giving beta blockers in hypoglycemia because um, in the olden books, I would say, we often are worried that they will mask the symptoms of hyperglycemia. But it seems here from these data done by uh, Rob Robinson and Stuart Lee that uh, beta blockers can protect against some of the cardiac arrhythmias caused by hyperglycemia. And again, these are data from Simon Fisher, um, who did a lot of studies in animals and rats. And it, again, in his studies, he will take animals and give them a big dose of insulin, make them hypoglycemic and look for cardiac arrhythmias and potentially death. And you can see here, if you look at the mortality, um, you know, eventually the, the animals were, were killed with saline, um, sorry, with the, I'm going to have some looked up here, sorry. Yeah, uh, and what they shout, found was that with the, if they give people's beta blockers or levetiracetam, they can prevent the mortality um, caused, by, caused by hypoglycemic events in, in these studies. And you can see with saline, there is a high degree of secondary heart block, but if you give a beta blocker that is protected, not protected with levetiracetam as you'd expect. And again, it's in Simon's group, one of the, it's, there's a slight uh, difference in opinion in a sense, because we know that with autonomic neuropathy, uh, you might be more predisposed to cardiac arrhythmias, but actually the QT prolongation seen in hypoglycemia, and you can see here in the glucose, these people were clamped down to glucose at 2.5. And you can see there, those people with um, who had normal cardiac um, arrhythmias had the 
uh, highest epinephrine, those with impaired awareness had a, a lower adrenaline response. But if you look at what happens with, the, with their QTC, those with uh, cardiac autonomic neuropathy in the, in the triangles there have the least prolongation of QTC. So maybe in those with, uh, with autonomic neuropathy, they get less adrenaline response and maybe they are protected a little bit from the QT prolongation. Um, so maybe there's an element of internal protection there that comes on. We also know that the impacts of hypoglycemia on the heart are, are delayed and prolonged because you can see here, um, these are some studies looking at what happens to the heart rate as people are made hypoglycemic. And as, although the overlong QT increase in these young children, you can see it actually happened quite a while after the um, hypoglycemia event happened. So it's not just at the time of the event, but there's prolonged um, impacts of hypoglycemia on the heart. There's also another question. A lot of the problems we see, of course, is this question, is it heart variability or is it hypoglycemia per se? And we know that variability and hypoglycemia are very closely linked. And so this was a very interesting study that came out from Anderson et al. And they looked at the, um, you can see what they did was they kept the plasma glucose steady, then they pushed it up to 15, and then they dropped it down to just under three. And that, in a sense, is much more reflective of what happens in real life. A lot of the hypoglycemia we see in day-to-day -day life comes off corrections, comes off high glucose readings. And you can see here, uh, although the hypoglycemia didn't have any impact uh, on the QTC level, you can see when they came, became hypoglycemic after, as the duration of the hypoglycemia increased, the QTC level there, they're prolonged. So uh, immediately on the heart, the impact of high glucose would probably be in terms of cardiac microvascular disease. Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done in that field, but, it, but maybe the variability causes even worse impact on the heart there, uh, as we can see from these studies. There's also an impact of, on not just the cardiac ECG levels, but also on actually on the cardiac function and cardiac contractility. So the S max here is the, is the time taken for the heart to contract. And you can see they've checked this in people with type 2 diabetes and heart failure at rest. And again, if you make them hypoglycemia, the, there is a slight um, increase in the S max of the heart. And that's probably linked to the adrenaline response coming from hypoglycemia. In non-heart failure, you can see there's a bigger response to hypoglycemia in the heart. The heart contracts um, much better. Uh, and if you take the whole walk test, so how you, in people at hypoglycemia, how it impacts their ability to, to move, you can see the, the uh, activity levels there, uh, the increase in heart contractility from activity there seems to be attenuated at hypoglycemia. They're not getting as much of a rise as you would expect. So I think a lot of these physiological studies, what they're showing is that the variety of impact of hypoglycemia on the heart and the different ways in which maybe in type one and type two diabetes, um, hypoglycemia can affect the heart. Simon is, uh, so we talked about the impact of QT prolongation. We've talked about the impact on um, uh, how beta blockers can prevent it. We've talked about how in type two diabetes and particularly with heart failure, um, you can see some impacts on actually the cardiac contractility and blood flow in the heart. But also, and, and all of these things come combined with the data Simon showed earlier about the impacts on platelet activation and on inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines uh, and on prothrombotic events kind of make contribute to see how recurrent hypoglycemia can increase the risk of cardiac events, particularly in those people who've got a, a baseline uh, substrate of increased risk. And so it kind of all boils down to if we know there's a risk factor, how do we prevent it? And, you know, we're all very concerned about the fact that well, we want to improve glucose uh, control and the DCCD said that that increases the risk of hypoglycemia. But actually what we know from real life data is that that isn't true. We know that glucose control in HbA1c and whether it's type one or type two diabetes, and there's, there's other slides I could show showing the link, hypoglycemia isn't necessarily linked to A1c. In fact, the, the main predictor for hypoglycemia is uh, high age, inappropriate use of sulfonylureas or insulin in elderly people, renal impairment, cognitive impairment, and previous severe hypoglycemia. Those are the main risk factors that if you see them, that's where the risk of hypoglycemia in the heart is the highest. I also want to spend a couple of minutes just talking about many of you now, I know in India, uh, it's started to become widely used. You use a bit of Libre, a blinded sensor just to see what's happening because many of your patients there don't do recurrent fingerprint testing. And when we do that, we see a lot of hypoglycemia. Uh, and there's a question whether that hypoglycemia is true if the patient didn't feel it, if the patient was asymptomatic, does it really matter? These are data from CGM on myself, 
using a Libre sensor. And you can see here that if I'm at a conference, these are during the EAST a couple of years ago. Um, if I'm, you're walking 18, 20,000 steps, you might have had a few drinks in the evening. You can see that even in non-diabetic people, sensor glucose can be low. And this, we don't really know, this probably doesn't signify an increased ca cardiac risk. So, uh, and there's some recent data from Denmark where they found that 75% of all episodes that you see on a CGM are asymptomatic. So I think when we're trying to judge someone's risk of hypoglycemia, for sure, ev episodes of severe hypoglycemia, which they need some third party help, those are the ones that are found to be dangerous. There is currently no evidence linking mild symptomatic episodes that your patient feels my glucose went down to 50 or 60 and I, I felt symptomatic. There's no evidence linking those episodes yet with mortality. All the linkage is with severe hypoglycemia. And there is certainly no evidence saying that asymptomatic events where the sensor was a little bit low and the patient didn't feel it, particularly at night, have any relevance. And I just want to make a point, uh, along with Simon, we're involved in a, in a large study that's going to try and look at the impact of these different types of CGM hypoglycemia. They're kind of short, sharp episodes and the long, prolonged episodes and see if they have differential impact on, on people living with, with, with diabetes. The study we've got can't quite link it to cardiac mortality. You need a very big study to that. Um, but again, just coming back, the, the main factors again to focus in on is if you've got hypoglycemia, the factors that link with death are long duration of diabetes, a long duration of insulin use, uh, and, and antibody positivity. Those are the kind of main factors that link in with uh, severe hypoglycemia and, and death. Another pointer for you in day-to-day -day life is that in the Devote 2 study, they combined the data from the, both the control and the intervention arms. And what they found was the biggest factor to tell you the linkage with severe hypoglycemia was the variability of fasting glucose. So if you've got someone on insulin, and if you just look at the variability of fasting glucose, if they have a high variability, that's a really good marker. They have low C-peptide. That's a really good marker of an increased risk of cardiovascular death in, in those people. And those are the people who have a high variability of fasting glucose, where you might want to be a bit more uh, cautious with the amount of insulin you give, reduce their risk of hypoglycemia, because those are the people who are at highest risk. Um, I was involved in a study with Exeter where we measured C-peptide to see whether, and you can see if the C-peptide is below 200 picomoles per liter in these people with type 2 diabetes, again, they're at higher risk of hypoglycemia and mortality. And my final slide is what can we do about this? This is a, a lovely study from Leeds, and they took people who'd had a severe hypoglycemia, and they, some people, a large proportion of people didn't want to take part, so they just observed their data. Uh, and then they took in people into the study and randomized them to a standard arm giving standard blood tests and routine care and an intensive arm where they were seen, you can see a weekly contact for one month, two weekly contact for the next month and then three monthly contact afterwards. So it was a simple uh, intervention with just a nurse ringing these people. And there was a 50% reduction in mortality out of five years. Really, really simple. No fancy CGM, closed loops, expensive drugs. Just someone contact these people, adjusting the doses and reducing the risk of hypoglycemia reduces the mortality by 50% over the next five years. So, so in summary, um, in type 1 diabetes, of course, severe prolonged hypoglycemia can cause dead in bed it, tragically, but thankfully the numbers are, are quite low and with modern insulins and technology, those numbers are reducing even further. In type 2 diabetes, severe hypoglycemia needing third party assistance is a predictor of mortality but therapy changes and support to patients can reduce this risk. Thank you.